Hi there, good evening folks. Uh, Duncan McDonald here from Speyside Wildlife. Uh, a real pleasure to be here. It's a bit strange, isn't it? Sitting here in a remote part of the, of the Cairngorms National Park when we're usually all gathered together in a marquee down at the bird fair. But I hope your, your bird fair is going well and that you're, uh, you're enjoying it nonetheless and that the weather's good wherever you are. This evening, um, I'd quite like to talk to you a little about the Inner Hebrides um, group of islands off the west coast um, and that's the that's the plan for this evening so sit back relax uh, and hopefully enjoy some of the the images you can switch me off if you if that helps you <laughs> and just enjoy the pictures so the Inner Hebrides um, are a group of islands less frequented or less well known than their their further um, their more westerly cousins the the outer hebrides that craig talked about yesterday evening but they are nonetheless less dramatic um, and also include uh, the largest of the hebridean islands which is the island of sky that you can see just now famous for its kulin mountains and its series of uh, large peninsulas although less of an island now that it's it's linked by a bridge of course to the mainland but these are islands that are superbly romantically beautiful with crystal clear azure water and beautiful sandy beaches dramatic skylines and of course full of great wildlife which is the main reason of uh, of talking to you about them this evening where are they? Well, as you look at the map there over on the, the furthest west, the, the orange bit is the Outer Hebrides that Craig was, uh, was telling you about yesterday evening. But as you come inland, you've got the big yellow island of Skye. And down south of that, there's the big green island of Mull. And as you head down further south towards uh, the Argyle Peninsula, you have the two large islands of Isla and Jura. And that makes up that bit of, of the western seaboard is the focus of the, of the talk this evening. And also with that are the smaller islands of uh, the small isles, Rumeg, Muck and Canna, Col, Tyree, Colonsey. And uh, they are wonderful islands to explore. That's just a, a little bit of a, a closer up image. So the pink islands on that map are the islands that we're focusing on on this tour. These are the islands of Summerled, the great early medieval warlord who wrested a lot of these islands and a lot of this territory out of the hands of the Norse. And he was half Norse himself. His, his, his mother was a Danish princess. Um, and he lent or rather was the progenitor of the great clan Donald. I am Duncan MacDonald, I, um, I trace my lineage back not quite as far as him but uh, I certainly link myself uh, to that great, that great family. And this clan Donald created one of the largest lordships, a pseudo kingdom that, that held sway over the western seaboard of Scotland and most of its islands from the 12th century through to the early 16th century. And their mark is, is indelibly left on the landscape with great castles like Mingari here and held their council. It was a confederation of, of names or a confederation of clans, if you like, um, who, whose heart, the beating heart of that confederation was here on the island of Isla, which is the great homeland of Clan Donald and the Council of the Isles here at Finlagen. This was a warrior nation. This was a culturally rich part. This was a, a Gallic revival for many hundreds of years that held sway on the Western seaboard and is remembered in, in place name, remembered in song and poem, 
and the past when visiting these islands is key to your enjoyment of the here and now. Knowing a little bit about that past um, makes the whole experience that bit more worthy. They, as you see here, these warrior slabs have a very Norse look to them and certainly the way that people travelled about and the way that this warrior nation um, moved men was very much in the, the Norse way. They, they used longships or uh, berlins as they were, became known. But not to, you know, to, not to put too fine a point on it, the Lordship of the Isles at any given time at its height of its power could put 30,000 fighting men on the field of battle at a drop of a hat, far more than any King of Scotland could do uh, similarly. So they were a great threat. This cultural revival is, uh, is also left in the landscape and the forms of, uh, like here on the island of Canna, an old, an old Celtic cross. Um, and again, you know, this is, is part of the, the experience that you have when visiting these most beautiful islands. And this little map here just gives you a sense of, at the height of the Lordship of the Isles, just how big an area of Scotland and also bits of Northern Ireland they controlled. But let's get to the wildlife, shall we? That's what we're here for. This is a view of the island of Rum, which also has a, a mountain chain called the Coolin. Although they're smaller than their the cousins uh, further north on the Isle of Skye, they're no less dramatic and wild uh, and remote, uh, difficult mountains to climb. Um, the sea around them around the small isles and all around the Inner Hebrides is rich water, full of um, potential for the wildlife enthusiast. And we have guided there for many years by boat usually um, and have had some utterly superb experiences. Rum, of course, is famous for um, its, its large population of Manx Shearwater. In fact, it's the largest single colony on the planet. Um, and these wonderful birds nest in the burrows high up on mountains like Askeval and Trolleval um, as they migrate north and visit every summer. And it's a great experience to be in these waters surrounded by swirls of sheer waters uh, and minke whales in amongst all that and great feeding frenzies of birds. Rum was also the location for the first successful re release of our largest uh, raptor in the UK, the white-tailed eagle. From the late 70s through to the mid 80s, birds were released from the island which have now gone on to colonise the inner and outer Hebrides and parts of the western seaboard of of Scotland as well and, and that population continues to grow and for those of you who are listening down in the south of England then fantastic some of these birds are now being translocated to the Isle of Wight um, to, to, uh, to bring about a, a breeding population in the south of England so it's all good news you'll see lots more sea eagles I'm sure as we go through these pictures as I mentioned, the, the seas around the, the small isles are, are very rich. And as, as we come into summer now, uh, as we're in August, is, is, the, is a great time to visit. If uh, cetaceans and seabirds and uh, sea life is, is what you're after, the sea is at its warmest and also the plankton is at its richest, which brings in shoals of fish and those bring in the predatory animals. Uh, likewise. So things like minke whale, the, the, the previous slide, and common dolphin in good numbers can be seen around the islands. Occasionally, of course, something bigger turns up. Darren had that fantastic live on Facebook just recently off Ardnamurchan Peninsula where the great John Coe, the huge bull orca, um, was seen live. Um, and they do occur much less frequently than places like Shetland and Orkney, but they are there. And, uh, and the great giant, the second largest fish in the sea, are brought in. They're there most of the year, but as the plankton comes to the surface, so the basking shark 
follows the plankton and hoovers it up with that enormous mouth. And some of these fish are 10 metres plus in length. It's, uh, it's a big fish. Interestingly, um, they also breach. And that can be a bit of a breathtaking spectacle if you happen to come upon it. Uh, a 30 foot fish leaping clear of the water is something to witness. And occasionally and increasingly um, other rarer cetaceans can be found in these waters. Increasingly species like humpback whale uh, and occasionally bigger still like fin whale can be seen. Rum is also famous for its ongoing uh, study of the island's red deer uh, undertaken by Aberdeen University and has been going on for, for many decades. And, uh, and a visit to rum in the autumn uh, is quite an oral spectacle <laughs> with the roaring from the north in particular of the stags. Further to the south, I'm just picking, I'm just picking some of the highlights from the Inner Hebrides. We're not going to go around every single island. That we, you'd be here for hours with me. I wouldn't be able to stop. So, um, but here we're moving down to Mull, the seat of the great clan MacLeod. Uh, sorry, yeah, MacLeod. And, um, and Mull is famous in particular, again, for eagles. It's known as the Eagle Island. Some of the first breeding white-tailed eagles from the release on, on rum settled here in, on, on Mull. And this is a great place to visit to see not just eagles but other raptors. Golden eagle in good numbers. And the Inner Hebrides as a whole, Mull particularly, have some of the highest densities of breeding eagles anywhere in Europe. And so a visit to there without seeing eagle um, is a wasted journey, <laughs> really. You're not doing your job if you're not seeing them. But it's a great place for other raptors. Hen harrier uh, breed there in number, fluctuating numbers. Uh, and it's one of the few places that I've been to where I've had fantastic views of perched merlin. You sometimes see merlin dashing through, but actually getting a, a merlin sitting for a while uh, so you can get the scopes on it and get a group on it is a great experience and Craig and I had that a few years back. This is more typical of a, a view of a perched Merlin at distance in the gloaming and, uh, and desperately trying to get a decent picture of it being quite a challenge. All of the islands of the Inner Hebrides, as I said, the waters are rich in food and as a result of that, um, not only good for cetaceans but other other uh, marine mammals in particular otter and mull is 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 equally as famous for its population of otters as, as it is for its eagles and it's a a great island to go a visiting them off the west of mull are a small group of islands called the treshnish isles and no visit to uh, the inner hebrides would be complete without a journey to the great seabird colonies of uh, the Treshnish Isles, full of guillemot and razorbill, um, with the blue waters out behind, you hope, fighting off the midges, which have been a bit terrible today, actually, it has to be said. Uh, and of course, it's Puffin Colony, and they're just wonderful. And uh, I used to, I like saying to, to customers that, and to guests that, uh, go to the Treshnish Isles and have a conversation with a puffin because they, they give you a great insight into what's going on in the Atlantic and you can get incredibly close to them. Uh, wonderful experience out on Treshnish. Other species that are regularly seen and that are good highlights of, 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 the, of a journey around these islands, Arctic tern breed in good numbers and of course with the Arctic tern come there piratical nemesis, things like the bonksy or great skewer, and their smaller, slighter cousins that come in two colour forms, or three colour forms really, sort of an intermediate form as well, the arctic skewer, both pale and dark phase birds, which are just beautiful. And these things, like their, like their uh, arctic terns that they're chasing, 
these, these birds are sun worshippers. You know, they come up here for our long days of summer and then they return to the South Atlantic and to the Antarctic for the long days of our winter and their summer. Increasingly on Mull and the Treshnish Isles and some of the others, uh, lots of conservation work going on to improve the lot of uh, this rare bird, the corncrake, which I'm sure Craig touched on last uh, yesterday evening. This migrant from deepest parts of Central Africa uh, is a, a wonderful sound to hear unless you're living on the island and played by it for 24 hours a day. Um, but it is wonderful to be able to pick these out. And I can remember a situation on, on the Trishnish Isles many years ago with a group where we had been having a wonderful experience with the puffins and then down we, we wandered. And at the foot of the cliff from which we'd walked up to see the puffins, there was this little group of nettles, this, this clump of nettles, and it couldn't have been any more than about five foot square from within which the corn crate was calling. And we stood and we looked and we looked and we stood and we skirted around this, this patch of nettles and none of us saw the bird <laughs> for the time that we were there. And views like this are a, a bit unprecedented and you want to be there early in the season uh, for, that kind of, um, for that kind of view. So th this is a view looking out over the, the island of, of Muck to the island of Rum from, the other, from uh, the other side. And these waters being as rich as they are, this is another view. This gives us the island of Muck in the middle. You've got Egg to the right and you've got the island of Rum. And just in the distance, you can see the mountains of sky. So to experience these islands, you really, really do need to get out there in a boat um, and do it the proper way. Basking sharks can be quite everywhere. Um, I can remember being in amongst between, this, uh, between egg and rum and losing count of the number of fins in the water that we were seeing. Um, they can be... Uh, they can be quite ubiquitous in the summer. This fish here was coming towards the boat that we were on with a group. And I was trying to get the group onto them and say, have a look at the size of this shark, measuring it from the tip of the tail to the snout that was sticking out of the water to begin with and the fin being equidistant between those two ends and trying to get across to these people. This has got to be a 10 meter plus fish coming towards the boat. And Somebody on the boat saying, you sure 10 meters, Duncan? You're not sure, you don't mean 10 feet. As it swung its tail round at the last moment and came broadside to the ship, which was 60 feet long. And, she, and this, this guest, I think, eventually saying, oh, I see what you mean. Yes, <laughs> it really is 10 meters in length. They are enormous, um, but great sweeping, gentle giants of the ocean. Well worth a visit. Down to the small cetacean, the little harbour porpoise, the puffing pig, and, um, and common dolphin, which can, in, can occur in these waters in really big schools, you know, sort of hundreds strong, that will always will, if they're in the vicinity and you're there on the boat, they will make a beeline for the boat and bow ride with you, giving you supreme pleasure. Cana is one of the most beautiful islands to me in the Inner Hebrides. And this is a view looking from Cana to the other side of the island of Rum. And, uh, and eagles pass between these two islands all the time. It's always worth just to remember to look up uh, as a, a golden eagle or a white-tailed eagle will regularly pass overhead. And it has sea cliffs on the, on the northern side of it that are, that are quite steep and again, a great place for things like Puffin, although you don't get as close to them as you do on places like the Treshnish Isles. And as I mentioned, eagles, as we'll keep coming back to. These are great islands for eagles. Uh, this picture here was taken on Cana. As we head south, we head down to the, the dual of the Hebrides, the Queen of the Hebrides, Isla itself, the great beating heart of Clan Donald, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, where the past is always to be seen, um, 
as you're watching and looking for wildlife. And Isla is an extraordinarily beautiful island, a rich, rugged landscape that is predominantly peat bog with small mountain ranges in it, famous for another product that we will get to in a little while, I'm sure of your, uh, I'm sure you'll be familiar with. And it's inextricably, inextricably linked to its near neighbour, the island of Jura, which again has breeding eagle, but it's famous for its uh, population of red deer and for seals around the coastline. Both species of seal, uh, common and, uh, and Atlantic seal, Atlantic grey seal, can be, a, uh, can be seen there in, in big numbers. And the machers and um, the breeding are, are, are rich in breeding waders through the summer, the th spring and summer months. Dunlin can be everywhere, um, but species like this, this is snipe, um, curlews trilling everywhere, and red shank to be seen, common sandpipers, which really is for a lot of, certainly mainland highland, uh, and I know we're talking about the Inner Hebrides, but this for me is one of the signs of summer, the common sandpiper. And wonderful, especially at the early time of year, uh, early part of the season, um, you get lovely summer plumage, breeding plumage, sandaling, which I just think is one of the most beautiful birds on the planet. Good numbers of eider duck breed around these islands and can be very easily seen. And as I mentioned before, that richness of, of, of seawater provides uh, a, a great bounty for otter. And most of these islands uh, have breeding otter. As I mentioned, Mull uh, is, is almost, is almost as, as famous for its, its otters as its eagles. But don't get me wrong, um, they're fairly straightforward to see on islands like Isla as well. Sky's great. The ferry journey out to Isla, you can be mistaken for thinking that the world's population of Great Northern Diver sits in those waters between mainland and Isla and Jura. They can be very easily seen and almost every little, every little bay has its Great Northern Diver in it. Um, sometimes right the way through the summer, they'll be there, some non-breeding birds will summer off uh, the, the bays of the Inner Hebrides. And eagles. <laughs> we go back to eagles. Um, White-tailed eagle uh, and golden eagle both occur in those southern parts of the islands. Isla is, of course, equally famous for its whisky. And no visit to these islands would be complete without uh, a whisky tasting of the peated whiskies of Isla and taking a bottle home, of course, Lagavulin. Uh, yeah, we'll say no more. You've all got your favourites, as I do. It's a great place. This, these inner Hebridean waters, as I said, uh, which are so rich uh, in, in fish, bring in from the west, and in particular St Kilda, which is the nearest breeding colony of gannets. These gannets come in uh, into the Inner Hebridean waters to fish through the summer because they are so rich. Isla is also famous for its breeding population of chuff, which uh, really just has a toehold in Western Scotland now. They used to breed on mull, um, but they've gone from there. So the islands of Isla and Colonsay are the two islands to visit if you're looking for chuff in Scotland. These islands are to be seen from the water um, and a, a journey around these islands and the waters between them uh, is the best way to do it. Through the summer when it's at its most colourful, with the sands blooming and thrift and the birds singing overhead and waders on the machers, where the past is never far behind you as you walk into uh, a new experience and where lovely little havens are there to welcome you like Tobamori on Mull and where 
The sea is still the highway for many people, as it has been for thousands of years. And where migration is important, um, I love these birds, wheat ears. I absolutely love them. Uh, they're just such a great journey that they make, and they're such a colourful little uh, accompaniment to the summer. They're wonderful little noises as well. So do do think about if you're thinking about the Hebrides, do think about the Inner Hebrides. Um, the, they are gems of islands with a, an experience to be found on every one. Thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, now, uh, some of you have been, while we've been talking away, have been asking some questions. So what have we got here? What kind of accommodation do we stay in? We, when we're there, it depends. If we're on a cruise, then we'll stay on a boat, which is fully catered for. Um, the boats that we've used in the past have, are crude. Uh, it's maybe not on suite accommodation. You might have uh, shared facilities on a boat, um, but always five-star cuisine uh, with cake at cake time and biscuits at biscuit time and, uh, and wonderful entertainment. Isla and Mull, we stay in hotels um, on, the, uh, on those trips that take in and are specifically centred on islands themselves. Uh, then th places, th the, and again, these hotels are always very well catered for with full uh, ensuite facility and good wildlife watching just in the, the gardens of, of these hotels. <laughs> When's the best time of year is a question. Whoa, that's tricksy. Uh, Any time's a good time of year. Um, spring is great uh, on those islands for the for migration and for that change of, of season from one bit to the other. Isla, I didn't mention that Isla's a great place to visit in the autumn because of the wintering uh, geese that come in, barnacle geese and Greenland white-fronted geese primarily, along with hooper swans and grey lags and pink feet and, and all this. It's a fantastic place and Isla in autumn and in early spring uh, at, at Easter time uh, is alive with birds, uh, of, even if it's just huge flocks of starlings. There are birds everywhere. Is it easy to combine a couple of islands in one trip? Uh, it is, yes, it is indeed. If you're doing it yourself, you can get island hopper tickets from Caledonia McBrain. You can come with us as well, and you can take in more than one island. Um, Jura, we tend to link with Isla a bit, if you're visiting uh, and coming with us to Mull we're in the summer, then we're likely to take in the Treshnish Isles with that, and that is really worthwhile doing. If we're doing a cruise around the Inner Hebrides, then yes, then we take in uh, many of the islands. Uh, we, uh, and I think um, that may well be on the cards for next year, so um, have a look. Uh, Walking is, uh, a question here, is it hilly or flat walking? It's a mixture of both. Um, uh, I, you know, some of the islands like Kana, um, it's difficult to walk around Kana without taking in a hill to get towards the cliff tops where the, the puffin colonies and the, and the eagle encounters are likely to be had. Um, but we do try and, you know, with all of our walking, we do try and take it gently and slowly and stopping regularly um, to look for what's around. So we never tend to just blister a, a walk. Oh, what is my favorite island? That's a, oh, I don't know how to answer that one. Um, when I was starting out in conservation, the island of Rum was where it started for me, uh, doing work out there, work experience from high school. Um, and so rum is deeply lodged in my heart, but as a MacDonald, the beating heart of the Hebrides is Isla, westering home with a song in the air, and all of that stuff. Oh, it's difficult. Um, but I'm going to go with Midgey Rum as my favourite. 
What was my best sighting on one of these trips? Ooh. Oh, that's hard as well. I can remember an experience with Simon Eves, who um, I've guided, I've had the pleasure of guiding with a few times. And uh, we were on Mull, if I remember rightly, Simon. And we went out on a boat, Alpha Beta. We'd had re 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 um, a report that a minke whale was, was out in the water somewhere. Uh, sorry, a humpback whale. So we went out on the boat. And I can remember the boat engines being switched off and we were all eating our pack lunches with a soft swell in the inner Hebridean water with the constant sound of Manx Shear Waters, Fulmer, Guillemots, Razorbills are in the water around us and this constant sound of <laughs> from all around the boat as minke whales were coming up all around us in this inky calm water under a bright blue sky and I think that was probably one of the most beautiful most memorable experiences of many uh, that I've had there. Is autumn a good time for basking shark? They're there um, in autumn but you the warm water brings the plankton to the surface and when the plankton is at the surface those plankton blooms that's when the basking sharks are more visible and basking shark as the water cools and as the air temperature cools the basking shark tend to sink so although they may still be there and, and actually some do cross the Atlantic and they, they disappear out but um, there's an awful lot still to be discovered about the movements of basking sharks. Certainly the summer months late spring through the summer months are the best time to be looking for basking shark rather than autumn. And a final one here are there midges in spring? There always seem to be midges in the Hebridean. Um, spring is a good time. Uh, midge season is, is now very much July, August, early part of September. Um, but a, a trip out there is worth it despite the midges. You'll always get, you'll always get days of, of an onshore breeze or if you're, if you're on a, a cruise with us around the Hebridean waters then uh, then you've always got a place to escape because the boat can get away from the midges. Um, spring is good time um, because there are fewer um, but you're less likely to see things like basking shark in the spring. Anyway, uh, I think I think that's all the questions. It's been a real pleasure being here with you this evening. A surreal distance talk um, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your attention and your questions. And I look forward to guiding you in the future. Thank you. <laughs>